I was interested as I was watching the, uh, the slideshow of R.A. Torrey that, if I'm not mistaken, you were at both of the groundbreakings, weren't you? The one here and the one in Pasadena. <laughs> You're a little kid back then, you actually had hair. <laughs> well, my wife and I last year celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. Uh, we are, in fact, a very godly couple, you see, because we did name all of our boys after people in the Bible, as Ed mentioned, but he got all their names wrong. Every one of them was wrong. Uh, we didn't name them Noah, Ben, Andy, and Zach. Uh, we did name them out of uh, characters in one chapter of the Bible. We named our boys after characters in Revelation chapter 6, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> Their names are death, pestilence, famine, and disease. <laughs> and every once in a while, death accompanies me when I speak. Um, disease and pestilence have been there frequently. Famine has never been with me. Um, well, today I'm going to talk to you about is what we have now, what they wrote then. The question I'm asking is, is what we have in our New Testaments today the same as what the apostles and their associates wrote 2,000 years ago. This is a question that uh, even uh, people who don't know anything about the Bible have an opinion on. And we need to have some answers. It has become the number one apologetic issue of our day, which is how do we know that what you have today in your New Testaments is really what the apostles wrote? It's the same question that the, the, the devil asked Eve in the garden, hath God really said? And it's a pre-evangelism question. We have to have some sense of assurance that what we have in our hands goes back to the apostolic witness to Jesus Christ. Well, there are skeptics who make all sorts of comments, and I want to begin by quoting that great scholar, Dan Brown, in his book, The Da Vinci Code, where he says, the Bible has evolved through countless translations, additions, and revisions, History has never had a definitive version of the book. Now, we've all heard that kind of a thing at Starbucks and at the office and at basketball games. People are saying, hasn't the Bible been translated and retranslated so many times, we can't possibly get back to the original? Well, it's not just novelists who are saying this, but we have atheists doing it as well. C.J. Werleman is a, a, a provocative author who, whose recent book, Jesus Lied, discusses this. His first book was... God hates you, hate him back. Now, that's a provocative title, and it's an ironic title for an atheist. God hates you, hate him back. <laughs> I think he means nothing hates you, hate nothing back, you know, but that wouldn't sell as well. well. He says, we do not have any of the original manuscripts of the Bible. The originals are lost. We don't know when, and we don't know by whom. We have, what we have are copies of copies. In some instances, the copies we have are 20th generation copies. I'm not sure where he gets that last statement, but uh, I think he made it up. More recently, Kurt Eichenwald wrote an article in Newsweek that came out on December 23rd called The Bible So Misunderstood It's a Sin. It was on the cover of Newsweek. You always get these kinds of criticisms of the Bible and evangelical Christianity at Christmas and Easter time. This was a very long article, and there were a number of people who responded to it. I wrote a blog on it and uh, uh, critiqued the view, but one of the statements he makes in here, which is dumbfounding to me, is he said, no television preacher has ever read the Bible. Neither has any evangelical politician. Neither has the Pope. Neither have I. And neither have you. At best, we've all read a bad translation. A translation of translations of translations of hand-copied copies of copies of copies of copies, and on and on hundreds of times. Now that's the kind of a statement that I want to address this morning, and he has articulated what so many people believe about the Bible. But Kurt Eichenwald is not a biblical scholar. C.J. Werleman is not a biblical scholar. Dan Brown is not. What source do they have that, that helps them to think along these lines? Well, there are skeptics who are biblical scholars, and Bart Ehrman has, uh, is one of these who has written a very popular book called Misquoting Jesus. Uh, I've known Bart for over 32 years. We're friends. We collaborate on projects together, and we have debated each other 
uh, several times on whether what we have today is what the apostles wrote. In 2005, he wrote the book, Misquoting Jesus, the story behind who changed the Bible and why. And uh, in this book, he basically went through the textual history of the New Testament and came to the conclusion that the Bible has been radically changed. Now, Bart didn't start out as a skeptic. He went to Moody Bible Institute as an evangelical, graduated from Wheaton College. Then he went to Princeton Seminary for his master's degree and PhD, studying under Bruce Metzger, one of the great textual scholars of the 20th, 20th century, perhaps the, great, perhaps the greatest one. And uh, uh, Bruce Metzger was a strong evangelical. By the time Ehrman got done with his doctoral program, he was moving away from uh, orthodoxy, and today he is an agnostic. Uh, within uh, a couple of months after this book came out, he appeared on John Stewart's The Daily Show. And uh, Stewart interviewed him about this book, and he said, I congratulate you, sir. This is one hell of a book. Kind of an interesting accolade for a book about Jesus, don't you think? The next day on Amazon, the book was number one. Within the first three months, he th sold over 100,000 copies. And I would ha have to say that tens of thousands of young people have abandoned the Christian faith because of writings by skeptics like Ehrman in books like Misquoting Jesus. Here's one of the things that he says. Not only do we not have the originals, we don't have the first copies of the originals. We don't even have copies of the copies of the originals, or copies of the copies of the copies of the originals. That's as far as it goes. Wordleman takes it out to 20 generations without any basis whatsoever. But in the conclusion, Ehrman says this. The more I studied the manuscript tradition of the New Testament, the more I realized just how radically the text had been altered over the years at the hands of the scribes. It would be wrong to say, as people sometimes do, that the changes in our text have no real bearing on what the texts mean or on the theological conclusions that one draws from them. Well, let's see how much the text has been changed. Now, there's two attitudes as we begin the study that I want us to be very, very careful to avoid. One is that of radical skepticism. Some of you may have come to uh, this uh, service this morning and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ and you may have this attitude. The idea that the Bible's been translated and retranslated so many times, there's no way to get back to the original and you Christians, as, as Ed said, are all knuckleheads. Not that he said we are, but just that he said that you know what I'm saying. Anyway, that's probably an attitude that most of us here are not going to be susceptible to. I'd have to say it's a terribly irrational attitude and it's not based on empirical evidence. But there's another attitude that Christians tip, typically come to, and that's the attitude of absolute certainty. There are people, uh, mostly from Ohio, I think, who uh, would say things like, in all seriousness, well, if the King James Bible was good enough for St. Paul, it's, it's good enough for me. And when they say that, I have to pitch the level of the conversation at something they can grasp. And so I say, well, how about them Hawkeyes? That's, that's a pretty amazing team. But a lot of us have absolute certainty in terms of our sense of what the Bible is. You come to church, you bring your Bible, and you believe that every single word in there is the Word of God. It isn't. How do I know that? Because Bibles change as we translate them and we try to uh, discover new manuscripts uh, we wrestle with the text, and the text that is actually being translated is changed from uh, generation to generation, from uh, edition to edition. The Net Bible that uh, is uh, Ed's favorite translation, I was the senior New Testament editor on it, and I was the textual scholar who uh, tried to determine what, what text it was that we translated. There are at least two places where for the next edition we have to change the text. So in those two places, which may not affect major doctrines, they are still significant, and we are going to change the wording of the text next time around. And so consequently, I have to say, if you use the Net Bible in its current iteration, in every particular, it is not the Word of God. There's a couple places where I'd say it differs. The NIV that came out in 1978, then 84, and then the most recent edition, 2011, the textual basis that they tra uh, translated from has changed in two or three dozen places. Well, that may not be a lot, 
but it does exclude absolute certainty. I can't say that what I have in my hands is in every particular exactly what the apostles and their associates wrote. Well, between these two extremes, which attitude should we be closer to? And that's what we're going to explore this hour. There's four questions we want to answer. How many textual variants are there? A textual variant is any place in the manuscripts where the wording disagrees between at least two manuscripts. It could be spelling differences, a single letter difference. Uh, they can be inconsequential. They could be significant. You could leave out words, add words, put words in different order. Uh, all of these things count as textual variants. This is the issue of quantity or the issue of number. A more important question is what kinds of textual variants are they? Do, do they affect things? Do they, do they, as, as Ehrman said, it's wrong to say that they don't affect the meaning of texts or the theological conclusions that we draw from them. What kinds of textual variants are there? And then more specifically, what theological beliefs depend on textually suspect passages? Wouldn't you like to know if the virgin birth is a secure teaching of the New Testament? Is it possible that every place that it's mentioned, that there are manuscripts that say, no, Jesus was not born of a virgin? We want to wrestle with those things. Those are important things because to be a Christian means that we should be committed to pursuing the truth at all costs, regardless of where it takes us. And at times it will take us to some uncomfortable places. And finally, has the essence of the Christian faith been corrupted by the scribes as so many of these skeptics that I quoted to begin with say? Well, I tend to spend all of my time when I uh, lecture on a preliminary issue, not this preliminary question, but, but uh, of these four questions, I'll spend maybe an hour dealing with the, the, the number of textual variants, and then I'll spend uh, just two more hours on the rest of the questions. So just sit back. That was a joke, you know. Gee, <laughs> you guys gotta lighten up sometimes. <laughs> anyway, preliminary question. Don't we have the original New Testament anymore? No, we don't. I can say that dogmatically because we are certain that the New Testament documents would have been written on a scroll and the, uh, on a papyrus scroll where you have the fibers that go horizontally and that's what they wrote on. That would be the inside of the scroll. Then you have the fibers that go vertically on the backside that basically keep it glued in place. None of our New Testament manuscripts is written on a scroll. Every single one is written on what's called a codex. That's a modern book form that was actually invented at the end of the first century. And it's uh, where you have a uh, binding on one side and then you have cut pages that you can flip through. In other words, a book. That was invented at the end of the first century. Now, Christians didn't invent it, but they did popularize it. And they were the first to do so. For the next five centuries, 80% of all Christian documents were written on a codex. Only 20% of all non-Christian documents were written on a codex. By AD 500, the codex had won over everybody, and that was the form of the book from that point on. It was the only time in the history of the Christian church that we were ahead of the technological curve. And uh, I think probably to this day and beyond, we'll never get there again, but once we were, and that was nice to see. <laughs> Howard Hendricks used to say, if you want to see what uh, people used to live like 50 years ago, come to Dallas Seminary and watch the students. We'll charge you uh, an entrance fee to watch them, but um, not ahead of the technological curve there. So if all of our manuscripts are written on a codex and we know the originals were written on a scroll, we don't have them anymore. Well, okay, I understand that, but what about the copies? Don't they agree with each other? If they all agreed with each other, then we could certainly get back to the original text. Unfortunately, no, they don't. They are all handwritten copies. A, a manuscript is defined as one produced before the time of the printing press, 1454, when Gutenberg inv invented the printing press. And by the way, we have a leaf of the Gutenberg Bible here that's in the case. That's stunning. This is why we have uh, guards here watching it. It's, it's a very uh, uh, important. He only published, I think, uh, 150 Bibles to start with, and there's something like 48 of them that still exist and that one leaf too. So there's a few leaves, but it's, it's, you gotta go see that stuff when I'm done, it's really amazing. So, these manuscripts don't agree with each other. You take the two most closely related manuscripts of the first eight centuries, Codex Vaticanus, which is at the Vatican, and Codex P75 or Papyrus 75, and they disagree with each other six to 10 times per chapter. There are no two manuscripts that agree more than those two in the first 800 years of the Christian faith 
but they disagree six to ten times per chapter. You extrapolate that out, if they were uh, uh, extant for the entire New Testament, it would be about 2,000 differences for the whole New Testament. And those are our two most closely related early manuscripts. Now, because of the disappearance of the originals, and because of the disagreements among the manuscripts, scholars have to do what's known as textual criticism, trying to determine what the wording of the original is on the basis of the evidence. So one of the things we have to wrestle with is the number of variants. And I've already defined a textual variant, so let me move on and show you this slide. Hope you like this. I, I did this myself, professionally done, nice blue color. Um, <laughs> There are approximately 140,000 words in the Greek New Testament that is published today, the standard critical text that all scholars, students, pastors, translators use. Or to be more precise, 138,162 words. And don't, don't ask me how I know that. I am really a full-time nerd. In terms of textual variants, the count up until last November was approximately 400,000. Then there was a paper presented uh, at the Evangelical Theological Society's annual conference in San Diego uh, by one of my former students who's getting his doctorate at Cambridge University. And he concluded that the numbers are closer to 500,000. That means that we have, on average, more than three variants for every word in the New Testament. Well, that's exciting news. Let's close in prayer. <laughs> This is where the skeptics leave this stuff. But I'm going to do a Paul Harvey on you and tell you the rest of the story. So here we go. The reason that we have a lot of textual variants is because we have a lot of manuscripts. If we had one manuscript, no variants. It wouldn't disagree with, this, uh, with itself. And yet that wouldn't tell us what the original wording is. As soon as you add a second one, and they might be of the same date, you can see that the second one at times is based on earlier manuscripts, much earlier, because the wording here looks like it comes from and uh, flows out of the wording there. It's, it's, a, it's a remarkable thing that scholars have to do, but uh, tens of thousands of hours have been poured into trying to determine what the wording of the original New Testament is. Let me begin by quoting from a fellow by the name of Richard Bentley, who is universally acknowledged as a brilliant textual scholar. He wrote 300 years ago, and uh, he wrote a book called Remarks Upon a Discourse of Free Thinking. Now, in this book, one of the things that he really wrestled with was the number of variants we had in the New Testament. And uh, it was based on what a fellow by the name of John Mill had published six years earlier. In 1707, John Mill published a two-volume text that took him 30 years to work on. It was just the New Testament with all the textual variants that he could find in the footnotes. He found 30,000 textual variants, examining only 99 New Testament manuscripts. And so when he did that, immediately Catholics were poking holes at Protestants saying, you have a paper pope and he has footnotes and we're not sure what that pope is saying. We don't know when he's speaking ex cathedra or not. Is it the words of the text or the words of the footnotes where we see the original? Many Protestants criticized John Mill by saying, this is the work of the devil to actually examine manuscripts of the Bible and put them together. Richard Bentley comes along and he defends Mill. Mill never defended himself at all. He spent 30 years of his life putting this work together. Two weeks after it was published, he died. Perfect timing. When I do my magnum opus, I want to die two weeks later, <laughs> then I can ignore all the critics. Richard Bentley said, if there had been but one manuscript of the Greek Testament at the restoration of learning about two centuries ago, he's talking about March 1st, 1516, when the first published Greek New Testament came out on a printing press, the one by Erasmus. And we have some of those early Greek New Testaments from the 1500s that uh, Azusa Pacific has put on display for us today. He says, then we would have had no various readings at all. And would the text be in a better condition then than it is now that we have 30,000 variant readings? It is good, therefore, to have more anchors than one, and another manuscript to join the first would give more authority as well as security. What Bentley is saying is the more you compare these manuscripts, the more you can ascertain what the wording is that produced them, that came earlier. And a lot of these manuscripts go back very early. 
in a lot of the, the text of a lot of these manuscripts goes back very early. We have a 10th century manuscript that was a direct copy of a late 4th or early 5th century manuscript. A direct copy, no intermediate uh, copies of it. So just because a manuscript comes later doesn't mean that its text doesn't go back very, very early. What New Testament scholars face is what's called an embarrassment of riches. And let me just lay this out for you. John Mill knew of 99 Greek New Testament manuscripts and he transcribed them all, put them into his apparatus. Today we know of over 5,839 New Testament manuscripts in Greek alone. That's over 500 times the number of manuscripts that he had access to. And what's really remarkable is, here it's over 500 times the number of manuscripts he used, and yet we only know of about four or 500,000 textual variants, about 12 times as many as what Mill uh, came up with in the first place. So the more manuscripts we're discovering, we're not seeing a lot more variants, but we are seeing some, and I'll explain what the kinds of differences are. The New Testament was translated into various languages early on. Beginning in the late second century, it was translated into Latin. We have more than 10,000 copies of the New Testament in Latin, handwritten copies before the time of the printing press. And then it was translated into other ancient versions like Coptic and Syriac and Old Church Slavonic, Armenian, Georgian, Gothic. Some of these uh, translations only a half dozen people in the world know. But we have anywhere between five and 10,000 copies of the New Testament in these other ancient versions. Altogether, that's between 20 and 25,000 manuscripts. Now, what's remarkable about this is that the average size manuscript is over 450 pages long. So we're not dealing with little fragments for the most part. We're dealing with manuscripts that are substantial. This is a lot of material. My institute, the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, or CSNTM, has as its primary objective to digitize every single Greek New Testament manuscript in the world and put those images online for anybody to access for free and uh, for free uh, for all time. We have, in our 12 years of existence so far, digitized over 300,000 pages of manuscripts, posting them on the internet. There are over 2.6 million pages to shoot altogether. We've done maybe 12% of the manuscripts. It's great job security. <laughs> but it's a daunting task. Now, if you had a magic wand, you could wipe out all these manuscripts in one fell swoop. We still would not be left without a witness. And that's because of church fathers who wrote theological treatises, commentaries, homilies. They, they, uh, uh, they, they, they were verbose. They did not have the gift of brevity. And they kept writing and writing over the centuries about the New Testament, quoting it many, many times over. There's a place in Germany that has tabulated how many times they have quoted from the New Testament. And the numbers back in the 70s came to over one million times. That's stunning. You could reproduce the entire New Testament virtually many times over on the basis of just the quotations by the church fathers if we didn't have the manuscripts. Well, let's compare this to other ancient Greek literature. The average classical Greek writer has less than 20 copies of his manuscripts still in existence. And that's a high estimate. For most of them, it's two, three, maybe half a dozen. But we'll say the average is about 20. I've used these numbers with skeptics. They've never disputed them. You stack them up, they'll be about four feet high. Well, how, high how high would the stack of New Testament manuscripts be? Not counting the church fathers. Well, let's see what it looks like. I can't do it just a straight vertical line. You'd never see the top of it. A little bit more, please. Thank you, that's better. A little more. And I got tired doing this in PowerPoint at that point, and I quit. That's a, a, a stunning thing. Four feet high, a mile and a quarter high. Well, let me just compare this to some uh, well-known Greco-Roman historians and biographers. Pliny the Elder. We have 200 manuscripts of Pliny's writings. He's about contemporaneous with the New Testament. We have about 200 copies of his manuscripts in existence today, which is very high. The earliest of which comes 700 years after he wrote. Plutarch, not nearly as many manuscripts, comes about 800 years later. Jo Josephus, who writes Antiquities of the Jews, in Book 18 is where he mentions James, the brother of the Lord, John the Baptist, and Jesus Christ. It's the only place where he mentions the, these people, but um, 
that book was copied more than any other manuscript or any other book of Josephus precisely because Christians copied it. But we're waiting 800 years before we get a single copy of Josephus' writings. And we have 20 <laughs> copies in existence today. That's it. Uh, Polybius, earliest copies, 1,200 years. Pausanias, geography of Greece, 1,400 years. Then we get Herodotus and his histories. He was the historian of the ancient Greco-Roman world, writing about 500 years before the New Testament was done. And Herodotus' histories, we have 26 copies of his writings in existence. We're waiting 1,500 years before we get anything of substantial size. 1,500 years. And then finally, Xenophon's Hellenica. He was a man who uh, wrote massive things in terms of history. And um, Xenophon, we're waiting 1,800 years before we get any copy of substantial size, of, of, of more than just some small scraps. Now think about that, 1,800 years. If that were the case with the New Testament, skeptics would have a field day. Our earliest copies would have been done sometime around uh, when the Wright brothers invented the airplane. They'd really be able to uh, mess around with us then. The New Testament has, on average, 1,000 times more manuscript evidence than the average Greek or Latin author, on average. That's remarkable. There's nothing in the ancient Greco-Roman world that even comes close. And I think what's, what's significant about this is that on the basis of the manuscript evidence, we have far more evidence that Jesus existed than that Alexander the Great did. And so when skeptics are, the way they are, t talking to you about the New Testament, um, we have some evidence that we need to bring in. Okay, well, we're back on, that's good. Nobody told me that, I thought I had to just keep talking about that slide. All right, the date of New Testament manuscripts. You know, if we have thousands of manuscripts, but they all come a thousand years later, we've got some problems. I want to tell you about the discovery of P-52. Speaking of planes, this was not the follow-up to the P-51 Mustang, the Mustang that fought in World War II. This is Papyrus 52. Here's a picture of this manuscript. In 1844, a German scholar who was extremely influential argued in a journal that the Gospel of John should not be dated any earlier than A.D. 160. And he preferred the date of 170. For the next 90 years, that view held sway so that European scholarship essentially said John's gospel is not historically credible at all. They wrote it off. Until 1934, 90 years later, when a recent doctoral graduate by the name of C.H. Roberts was studying at uh, Manchester University in England and was at the John Rylands Library. And he had a box of papyri that had been excavated from Egypt in 1920. And he pulls one out and he's looking at this thing. And he notices that the handwriting is on both sides of the manuscript. The first thing that told him was that this was probably a Christian document written on a codex. He transcribed the text. On this side that you see, John 18, verses 31 through 33. On the back side, John 18 verses 37 and 38. He sent photographs of this manuscript to the three leading papyrologists in Europe at the time. Every one of them independently wrote back to him and said, Dr. Roberts, this manuscript should not be dated any later than A.D. 150 and should be dated actually closer to A.D. 100. A fourth demurred and said, I think it's from the 90s perhaps. I don't know about you, but I, I grew up actually in Newport Beach, not too far from here. I consider all of you inlanders. And, uh, and now I'm a real inlander living in Dallas where the surf sucks. But um, I was taught in school that generally speaking, a copy of a document is not written before the original of the document is produced. Is that what you're taught here too? Yeah. This sent two tons of German scholarship to the flames. And it reminds me of a statement that William Lane said, and you could, this is a great slide for you to look at. I thought you did a nice job on that. An ounce of evidence is worth a pound of presumption. Here it is, this small manuscript, the size of a credit card, destroying two tons of European scholarship in one fell swoop. One scholar said, the, the, the Gospel of John, the ink on that original manuscript must have been barely dry when this manuscript copied from it. It's remarkable. I'm gonna skip over these next two slides. We, we, we won't wrestle with that. Uh, but. Uh, the bottom line question we're really asking for this first area of how many variants there are 
is has the Bible been translated and retranslated so many times that we don't know what it originally said? Well, a way to compare this is with the King James Bible, produced in May of 1611, it was uh, when it was first published, and the New Testament was based essentially on seven Greek manuscripts, the oldest of which went back to the 11th century, the most recent of which was 16th century, 17th century perhaps. And 400 years later, now we have almost a thousand times as many Greek manuscripts as they had. And some of our manuscripts, not just P52, but quite a few, go back almost a thousand times earlier than the earliest manuscript they had. We are not dealing with something where we can't get back to the original because as time goes on, we're actually getting closer and closer to the original text, not farther away from it. It's a myth to think that scribes copied a text and they burned the original before they do the next one or that we're basing our, our faith on translations of the text. We're basing it on the original Greek and the translations are helpful to us, but most scholars, all scholars would say the original Greek is far more important than these early translations. And we can look at these manuscripts. Okay, so the second question, the quality of variants, what kinds, and I, these three I could deal with relatively quickly. What kinds of variants are there? Well, 99% make virtually no difference at all. Most of them you can't even translate. And the vast majority of them are, are spelling differences. <laughs> Let me fix that, is that a little bit better? There you go. But you still know what I meant. Until the 1700s, even English didn't have any kind of standardized spelling until Webster came along and said, we need to spell words one way. The same with Greek manuscripts. These scribes were creative spellers. My brother is a creative speller. One time he spell, spelled his own name incorrectly on a check to me. I don't know if that was on purpose, but anyway. Well, differences in spelling, it's the largest category. In fact, the most common textual variant we have in our manuscripts is what's called a movable new. That's where you have N at the end of the word when the next word starts with vowel, like a book, an apple, or Westmont, a book, a apple. But uh, we, we still love them. There's different spellings for proper names, like the name for John in Greek is Ioannes or Ioannes. One with two Ns, one with one N. Every single time the name John appears in the New Testament, there's different spellings in the manuscripts. And then there's the Greek definite article that uh, loosely we could call the. It occurs almost 20,000 times in the New Testament. I wrote my master's thesis on when it does not occur. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on when it does occur. These two works would cure the most hopeless insomniac. <laughs> and I still am not exactly sure why it occurs in the New Testament. It occurs with proper names. The Joseph and the Mary left Jerusalem in Luke chapter three. What? We, nobody translates it that way. We've never lost anything and, and we're not exactly sure why it's used, but it is. Then you've got word order differences. Word order in Greek really focuses on emphasis, not meaning. You can say John loves Mary in any order you want. And as long as you understand what the ending is, one is gonna tell you the subject, the other tell you, tells you the direct object. You could say Mary loves John in that order and every Greek would read this as John loves Mary because of the inflection, because of the ending. Word order focuses on emphasis, if anything, but does not change meaning. So about a year and a half ago, I decided to ask myself the question, how many times, how many different ways can you say John loves Mary in Greek, where every single time it's translated exactly the same, John loves Mary. This is what geeks do. And um, so take out your pens and paper, because this will show up on the test. Here are eight ways you can say John loves Mary in Greek. I don't see anybody writing, you should get these down. Here, and, and this slide you needed to see because if you don't see it, you can't understand what I'm trying to say here. Here's another eight ways to say John loves Mary and some more. All of these are translated exactly the same. John loves Mary. But then you've got it with conjunctions that are often untranslated and now we have some more ways. Every one of these is different. Come on, we'll get there. You're not writing. 384 ways to say John loves Mary in Greek. But that's not all. That's what I got to after I was tired of doing this. I hope you appreciate it. It took me eight hours to put those slides together. <laughs> and they're all, they're all different, and, and we zipped right through it. Nobody even cares. And... <laughs> well, what's the point? 
Well, there's other legitimate word orders that swell the numbers to well over 500, and a different verb for loves mushrooms the numbers to nearly 1,200. Okay, let's go back to what Bart Ehrman says. We could go on nearly forever talking about specific places in which the texts of the New Testament came to be changed either accidentally or intentionally. The examples are not just in the hundreds, but in the thousands. Yeah, that's true. And we'd be bored to death talking about them because the vast majority of them don't affect anything. It's like John loves Mary. How many ways can you say that? Well, we could have spent some time discussing each one of those, but everybody would be asleep at the end of the class. So he's true, he's right. But he hasn't told you the rest of the story, has he? If we can say John loves Mary over a thousand times a Greek without substantially changing the meaning, the number of textual variants for the New Testament is meaningless. In fact, you extrapolate this out, that means we could literally have tens of millions of variants for the New Testament without it affecting the meaning at all. What counts is the nature of these variants. Well, the smallest group of variants are those that are both meaningful and viable. That is, they have a good chance of being authentic. They come in important manuscripts, early enough manuscripts, and less than 1% of all textual variants are both meaningful and viable. It's closer to one-fourth of 1%, and I'm using that in a generous way. Most scholars would say it's somewhere around 40 or 50 differences that we can't agree on of four, uh, meaningful and viable variants. That's about it out of the 500,000. Let me give you a couple illustrations. Mark 9, 29. And Jesus said to his disciples, this kind can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. Or did he just say by prayer? He was dealing with particularly pesky demons and the disciples couldn't exercise them. And Jesus said, here's how you got to do it. Now, most scholars would say, put a period at, after prayer because it, and fasting comes in the later manuscripts. It probably isn't original. Uh, but it may be authentic. Maybe if you're doing some exorcisms, you might want to hedge your bet and do both. But uh, as, as you look at me, you can realize I, I agree with the shorter reading. So let's, let's press on to the next one here. Revelation 13, 18 is one that's a bit better known. Let the one who has insight calculate the beast's number, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Well, everybody knows. The Antichrist, that's 666. Well, not so fast. In 1843, Konstantin von Tischendorf, who celebrated his birthday yesterday, by the way, he's 200 years old, not alive anymore. I think Ed was a friend of his. Um, <laughs> he went to the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, and he examined a manuscript that had been scraped over 800 years later by another scribe who wrote text on top of it, he was the first one to be able to decipher, decipher almost all of that undertext. And when he got to Revelation 13, 18, of this most important manuscript, now it's one of our most important manuscripts for Revelation, he read the number as 616. Five years ago, I had the privilege of seeing that same manuscript, and sure enough, it said 616. In 1999, at the Ashmolean Museum of Oxford University, they published another manuscript, a papyrus. It had 26 fragments spread out over nine chapters of Revelation, and it just so happens to be our oldest manuscript of Revelation 13. The number of the beast in this manuscript is 616. I had the privilege of examining that under a magnifying glass and a microscope back in 2002. These are the only two manuscripts we have that have the number of the beast as 616, but it, it may be the right number. I don't know, it would take a couple hundred hours and still I would be uncertain. Most scholars would say, we're pretty convinced that 666 is the number of the beast and 616, that's, that's the neighbor of the beast. He lives a few doors down, you know. <laughs> but I know of no Bible college no theological institute, no seminary, no church, no denomination that has this for its doctrinal statement. We believe in the virgin birth of Christ. We believe in the deity of Christ, in the resurrection of Christ. We believe in the Trinity. And we believe that the number of the beast is 666. <laughs> it may be important, but it's not that important. Now, I've been the consultant for four different Bible translations. And I'm, I usually deal with the text. Uh, in my more carnal moments, I think about the next translation I work on at Revelation 13, 18, 
I'm going to change the text that says the number of the beast to 616, just to see what happens. <laughs> it would send about seven tons of popular Christian literature to the flames. You have no idea how loony people can be when they think about this. And don't Google it right now, because we'll know that you've upset my... Uh, <laughs> Do that after church, it's a lot of fun. What theological beliefs depend on textually suspect passages? Well, let's go back to Dan Brown, that great scholar, where he actually believes this. Sir Lee Teabing is speaking to Sophie in his living room, and he speaks about that moment in history. It's the moment when Emperor Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea, which was the first universal church council, and it defined what they meant by the deity of Christ. It did not invent the deity of Christ, and I'll demonstrate that in a minute, but it defined what we mean by the deity of Christ. And so Teabing, however, says, until that moment in history, Jesus was viewed by his followers as a mortal prophet, a great and powerful man, but a man nonetheless, a mortal. He was not deity, is what Teabing was saying, and what Dan Brown and many, many others actually believe. Well, you remember how I said an ounce of evidence is worth a pound of presumption? Let's take a look at another ounce of evidence written approximately 150 years prior to the Council of Nicaea. This is another papyrus, which has almost all of John in it, very important manuscript, P66. This is the very beginning, John chapter one, and uh, I'm gonna read John 1.1 1, 1 for you. Read along the text with me, if you would, uh, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, uh, with God, and the Word was God. You've heard that before, I think, right? All of our Bibles have that. It doesn't matter what the age of the manuscript is. It doesn't matter what language it's in. Every single manuscript we have, no matter the date or language, says virtually the same thing in this verse. Jesus is unequivocally called God. And the same can be said for the major passages that affirm his deity, his virgin birth, his sinlessness, his death on a cross, his bodily resurrection, and his second coming. Some of them either affirm it or they don't affirm it, but they don't disagree with these things. And that's the point. A non-affirmation is not a disagreement. Like in 1 Timothy 3.16, we either have God was manifest in the flesh or he was manifest in the flesh. I think he is the original wording there, speaking about Jesus Christ. If he is authentic, it's not a denial of his deity, it's just not an explicit affirmation of it in that verse. And yet we have many other manuscripts, many other places to do that, say that. Let me close with a couple of quotations by Bart Ehrman. At the end of his book, in the paperback version that came out after the hardback had been selling quite a bit, the editors wanted to add an appendix, and it's, and it's in this paperback version. Um, and they asked, the, it is kind of a thing that people would turn to to say, oh, I gotta buy this book, it's very back of the book. Why do you believe these core tenets of Christian orthodoxy to be in jeopardy based on the scribal errors you discovered in the biblical manuscripts? Well, listen to what Ehrman has to say. Essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variance in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. What? Tens of thousands of people have abandoned the faith because of writings like Ehrman's. But here, when he was asked the question point blank, he couldn't deny it. The essence of the Christian faith is absolutely certain. We may not know what every single particular is. I don't know if it's 666 or 616, faith alone or I mean, uh, fasting and prayer or, or just prayer. But uh, what I do know is that the essentials are not in jeopardy at all. After this came out, a few weeks later, they took this appendix out of the paperback version. You can't find it in there anymore. I wonder why that is. I wonder how honest that is. Well, let me close with an unnatural segue. A polar, bear man, a polar bear attacks a man in Canada and bystanders do nothing. The media didn't even report this incident. Now have in your mind's eye what this looks like. I know we have some young kids here, so you may want to close your eyes because I'm going to show you the photographs of this polar bear attacking this man. Y'all ready? Okay, let's take a look. You had a different picture, I bet, didn't you? What kind of a picture did you have in your mind when I said there's 500,000 texture variants? You may have had a picture of a polar bear shredding a man. When you think how many variants there are, think about this polar bear attacking this man. 
And his 501 blues may have lost a couple threads, but that's it. What we have today, in all essential respects and in most particulars, is the very Word of God. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you so much for giving us confidence that we can have the Word of God in our hands that we know that the apostles and their associates wrote. And Lord, we pray that we don't just hold this up as some kind of a trophy, but that we look at Scripture and say we must obey it. And we pray that it transforms our lives for the sake of the gospel and Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.